Welcome back to Advent Next, everybody. Uh, this week, we are gearing up for Black History Month, and I am going to bring on guests and speakers who can really shed some light on the topic. I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, great Black theologians, and this whole concept of Black theology is something that's been very much not explored. Um, it may be in the mainstream uh, within evangelical churches and within Adventism in particular. And so I just wanted to take the time to kind of set the stage and really talk a little bit about black theology and black liberation theology and what that is all about. And so I just want you guys to stay tuned. We're going to drop that intro. All right, so black history and the black experience is something that we're going to be exploring throughout the year, but particularly this month, I want to honor the, the heritage and the legacy of African Americans who have made contributions to Christianity and to society at large. So kind of getting right into it, you know, the father of black theology is a guy named James Cone, and he began to develop this theology. Uh, this is back in the 60s and the civil rights movement is happening, and Malcolm X said something particular about Christianity being the white man's religion. And James Cone wrote a book called Black Theology and Black Power because he wanted to give a different perspective in a way that African Americans could take ownership of their Christianity and also to really kind of call out some of the misconceptions that have happened, particularly in America, of anglicizing Jesus and anglicizing Christianity in a way where racism has been a part of kind of the, the undertones of what Christianity really is. And sometimes, you know, we've had some really great guests come on the show. And I think one thing that I really particularly appreciated is that sometimes, you know, as, as white theologians, they don't recognize that white is a color. And with that comes a sense of privilege, but not just privilege. And what I mean by that, I know that's a very touchy word. And so let me just back up really quick because I know <laughs> Some of you will be tracking with me and some of you will not be tracking with me. James Cone, Black Theology and Black Power, that might be the first time that you've ever heard of these books and that's okay. And, and I'm by no means, I'm an expert, but I want to, I, I really want to appeal to those who really don't have any type of understanding of, of, you know, why this might be important and really bring certain issues to light because Within kind of white Christianity, there is a sense that when I say privilege, meaning that they don't have to uh, take their race into consideration when they're reading the text. You know, there's something where people can say, oh, I'm just reading the text very plainly. I don't have a lens. And that's never the case, right? We all bring our own life experiences, whether it's our gender, our race, or sexuality, we are bringing them to the text. And just to be aware that white is a color... <laughs> And with that it comes with a certain amount of ability to maybe focus on different parts of theology rather than certain parts of theology that would really speak to the African-American experience. And so going back, James Cone was somebody who wanted to speak to that experience and saying that Christianity should be a liberating force, right? That you see throughout the Bible, God liberating the oppressed. He liberates the children of Israel out of Egypt um, he liberates Joseph out of prison, out of the, his brother's hands, and into the prominent place within Egypt. There's this continual picture of taking somebody who is oppressed, taking somebody who has very little, and justice is about meeting out equality and making restoration for the types of oppression that that person has experienced. And so when looking at the scriptures, you know, there is a specific uh, uh, tale that James Cone is trying to take when he says we need to look at the scriptures as primarily a liberating power. And so I want to get into some of his quotes to really give you a picture of who he is, as well as some of the books that he's written. And just to kind of give you a little background, so James Cone, you know, um, he first addressed this theology when Malcolm X uh, had made the statement that Christianity is a white man's religion. And so wanting to provide ownership for his community, 
to that they could have a stake in Christianity, that this was not solely a pre- an oppressing power, but but contrary to that, Christianity is about liberation and freedom. And in fact, making the comparison even that Jesus, who came to this world as an immigrant of, of a teenage mother, of someone who was poor and somebody who was looked upon as an outsider, he came from Galilee, you know, he was very much like this, the, the other, right? He was the other. And that if he were to come in this context, he very much, well, might have come as a black man. And because he represented the class of people who were the most oppressed. And by taking that type of, you know, um, perspective at the gospel to say, you know, let's see what Jesus actually stood for and how would that manifest today in our culture, he's making this application and this comparison that Jesus would probably come as a black man. And so how would now the church in North America really respond to that? You know, historically, Christianity, the evangelical church, has been either by their complicity in doing nothing or by their proactive work um, have institutionalized slavery and then on top of that uh, have continued the effects of slavery through segregation and through other racist systemic both systemic and individual policies that have kept a particular class of people, African Americans, in poverty and in in in, in a subhuman uh, type category. Now, I'm not speaking across the board for every white person. I'm talking about historically uh, what has been kind of majority culture of evangelicalism. And a lot of the remnants we can still see today. So this isn't something that has, you know, erased, it's purely stuck in the past, strictly, uh, strictly historical. That's not the case, right? We see those remnants still with us in present today. And so I want to read some of these quotes because they've made me think. I want them to make you think. And I want you guys to be excited about engaging with these types of texts and with these types of dialogues because there is a certain call for unity. And what would a unified church across color lines really look like, right? That we take up the burdens of the oppressed, that we walk side by side one another in our struggles, and that we bond together in brotherly love and the hope and in the calling of Jesus Christ, right? But, you know, we also have to be realistic. We have to take the world for what it is, and really address the wrongs that are present. And if, there, if you're somebody who, for example, that's not a part of your regular life, you don't deal with racism on a regular basis, then you are lucky, right? You are a part of the privileged class. And as a part of that, um, I think that it is our obligation to be able to start placing our shoulders um, under the yoke that is weighing down and crushing our brothers, however that may form, right? So here are a couple quotes that I wanted to, to bring out, and it says, to sing about freedom and pray for its coming is not enough. Freedom must be actualized in history by oppressed people who accept the intellectual challenge to analyze the world for the purpose of changing it. And so he's talking about that sometimes we can um, over-spiritualize the gospel, We can make the gospel a futuristic experience that justice will be meted out in heaven alone. And this is kind of a radical shift of saying, no, justice should be meted out now. In fact, historically, God's call upon his people to provide justice was not about, you know, share with them a tale of future restitution. (laughs) It was, no, fix the wrong now. And if you don't, I'm going to come down and I'm going to cause a lot of trouble, right? Like that's historically, when we look at the Old Testament and the Bible, that's, that's God's call to his people. And I think that, you know, there are different camps, dispensational camps that say we're, we're in a new dispensation. God is doing something very different. And I just want to, to point out, like, the same Jesus of the Old Testament is the same Jesus of the New Testament, 
And it's the same Jesus that will be with us at the second coming, right? Where he comes back as an avenger, you know, uh, taking vengeance on his enemies. Like that's a very scary picture of who Jesus is that I often don't like to think about, right? And the Jesus who was also here providing a message of love and comfort and, and telling us how to overcome sin by ridding our hearts of bitterness and unforgiveness. These are things that are also very true, but we also have to be very careful about, you know, mismatching something, right? By saying, you know, by forcing people to forgive when really what in this particular situation, a pursuit of justice and restitution would be the proper course of action. So here are some quotes from his book, Black Theology and Black Power. Now, again, he is the father of black liberation theology. Uh, this book was written in 1969. Now, I'm by no means an expert. I hope to find an expert to bring on. And even if you don't agree with everything that this person says, I think it's a historical piece of work that should be read, that should be wrestled with, that should be brought into consideration of present ministry and the way that we go about and thinking about how we present theology in the gospel. 